David Remnick put his in-depth knowledge of Russian politics to work in the 1994 book Lenin's Tomb. It won him the Pulitzer Prize. His latest effort picks up where that one left off, covering the past seven years of a nation in turmoil. Through essays and insights, he looks at the forces shaping today's Russia. I am pleased to have this friend of our broadcast back. Congratulations. Thank you. It's a good book. Thank you. All right, let me just pick up from the forward. It's easy because your wife has such a provocative first sentence from the preface. To live in Moscow at the century's end is to exist in a strange and contradictory landscape, one filled with both ruin and possibility. Question. Russia is in transition to something good or bad? Russia's in transition. <laughs> and there was, a, there was a, uh, an essay that Orwell wrote in 1948, and he was referring to communist Russia, obviously. And the, point of, uh, the point of the essay was that very often what happens is that the, the, the mistakes of transition, the grotesque uh, aspects of transition, harden and become the permanent uh, factors of a state. The danger in Russia today is that the grotesque aspects of transition, the rise of an enormous mafia which controls half, fully half the economy. Half? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, according to an American survey. But aspects like that will harden and become the Russia we know 50 years from now. And that has to be uh, looked at very carefully and, and prevented against. Obviously, we can't do anything much about it, some. Uh, but it, it's in the hands of the Russians. But this, this is the difficulty of writing a book like this as opposed to Lenin's tomb, which had an ending. Mm. Fireworks going off over the White House, quite literally. And this is trying to capture something in transition and change and freeze it for a moment and look at it. See, Power is adrift as we speak. Power is very much adrift. I mean, we make too much of the day-to-day uh, -day changes of the health of Boris Yeltsin. He's got quadruple bypass surgery one day. He looks almost lifelike the next, and then he survives a Helsinki summit with Bill Clinton. What's, what's really more adrift is the notion of what, what is power uh, in Russia today. Uh, unfortunately, it's becoming an oligarchy uh, that around Yeltsin are a group of new oligarchs, bankers, automobile magnates, and all those kind of people who basically sponsor his Kremlin leadership, who stood behind his election in June and July and cheated their way to victory, uh, largely in a financial sense. What does this say about Boris Yeltsin, who you had great hopes for at the beginning of his reign? Well, Russians had great hopes for in 1991. Boris Yeltsin won a landslide victory to become the Russian president in 1991. And it had seemed in 1991 that he was a kind of yang to Mikhail Gorbachev's yin, yeah. <laughs> so to say, that even though they seemed to be in direct opposition to one another yeah. uh, on a personal level and on a political level, then in a way there were a historical continuum that Gorbachev could uh, initiate certain reforms to bring about, uh, bring the Soviet Union into the world, to open it up, uh, but couldn't travel the political path fully into what we saw in 1991, and there, there he couldn't let go of where he came from. He, well, he had a great. Uh, he had, couldn't let go of the Communist Party right. for well, one thing, whether he from. wanted to or not. Right. And uh, and certainly Yeltsin shrewdly, uh, whether it was in terms of self-interest or in terms of ideals or a little bit of both, could let go of the Communist Party and make a politics of that. But he's disintegrated. I mean, it's not just a physical disintegration since 1991. Uh, he's responsible for 80,000 people dying in Chechnya. Well, you suggest that we are watching not only his physical decline, but his moral decline. I think so. I think so. And uh, I think Chechnya is the worst blot on his record. Uh, no better, no worse than uh, LBJ in Vietnam. And did it come because why? I mean, what happened? Well, there are, there are critics who say that there is a continuum uh, that begins in Boris Yeltsin's career about the way he makes decisions, this kind of abrupt authoritarian way of making decisions. And whether it has its roots in 1993, which is a far more complicated political decision, when, which ended up with a firing on the parliament, or is, does it have its roots in the growing nationalism in the country and hatred, by the way, of Chechens, which made it easy to make this horrendous blunder, uh, is hard to say. Um, but one of the things that, that, that is very striking about the Chechen war is that ethnic Russians dislike Chechens more than they dislike Jews or Azerbaijanis or some of their other least favorite ethnic groups. And when it became clear that Chechnya was campaigning for independence and at the same time was the center of a lot of, a lot of criminal activity, 
Yeltsin prosecuted this war very quickly and brutally, and there were very, there was very little protest on the streets of Moscow. What's interesting to me, too, is how you do these books. Um, you introduce, you, as some reviewer even said, it's like David goes out and takes us with him and introduces the people, mm -hmm. almost suggesting to us that the parts make up the whole. If you meet and examine the players, in the end you will see the complete picture. You also, mm -hmm. one more part, mm -hmm. you... <laughs> okay. What? No, go, go, go. <laughs> you also believe, as Solzhenitsyn believes, that it is people that determine history and personality, do. not event. I think they both do. Look, the great problem of war and peace for, for Tol Tolstoy, the, the great writer under whose wings we are all mice, uh, Tolstoy struggled with mice? this problem. Yeah, I mean, he, Tolstoy wrote a, a novel, War and Peace, in which the first 850 pages tell you in more ways than is possible to know that individuals can influence and happenstance can influence the course of history enormously and in his case it's Napoleon and all the various political actors then the last 250 pages is taken up with Tolstoy writing an essay telling us that that uh, trends and forces and really are the, are the guiding principles of history it's that tension that, that uh, caused Isaiah Berlin to write the essay about Tolstoy called the hedgehog and the fox I think that had Mikhail Gorbachev not come along, or Yeltsin, or Solzhenitsyn, or Sakharov, that Russian history would be enormously different, or Peter the Great, or whatever. I don't think that it's just, as the Marxists think, just forces and yeah. grassroots. But here is the argument also. Sure. Is that if it hadn't been Mikhail Gorbachev, it would have been someone else. Yeah, but not necessarily in 1985. It might have been in 2020 after the economy further declined and declined and declined. This is the credit you have to give Gorbachev. That Gorbachev would probably still be in office today and 10 years from now had he decided to go along with a kind of status quo. Or even if he had gone as far as his great mentor Yuri Andropov did in reform, which is a kind of disciplined, communist-based reform. Could he have done what the Chinese have done? That's the great question that communist par former Communist Party officials torture themselves over. Gennady Yanayev, who was one of the coup leaders in 1991, told me after the coup, he said, you know, we should have put statues up to Deng Xiaoping because he would have shown us the real way. <laughs> of course, his, his impulse is self-interest and he flagellates right. himself every day. But no, I think Russia is created by Russian history and Russian people and the Chinese, an agrarian country, is far different. Uh, I, it's a completely different yeah. uh, landscape. You do believe, though, and you say this in the end, when you look at the future, Russia will be a superpower again, and a greater superpower than China, because of its... Not quite. Not quite. I think it'll be a great power. You don't think it'll be another superpower? Look, Russia's... I don't know what a superpower means anymore, except that we define ourselves that way, in that we, we behave as an imperial power in a way that... Maybe no you were quoting somebody else when I read that. No, but the, I, the guy no, from I, the, no I, I do believe that Russia will be a power again. And it, it is in its moment of greatest weakness, which makes it perhaps even more dangerous than if it were a power again. Um, and I believe that the Chinese euphoria that's going on now is somewhat overrated, and it, and it influences U.S. policy. You know, I'm, I'm one who, for example, believes that we're making a big mistake pushing Russia around so quickly and so definitively on NATO. I don't, I don't quite understand this, why we're putting all our resources into expanding NATO uh, at a time when Russia is in no mood for and in no circumstance for invading Eastern Europe. And the downside and, is that... And it, at the it, same time in China, we're behaving in a cowering way. It, it, it is a very strange bit of foreign policy at a time where we need to be, the United States needs to be rethinking its place in the world in a new world, that we're behaving this way toward Russia. Well, it's, it's probably based on some erroneous assumption, isn't it? That China will be this huge power uh, and economic power because of its population, because of the market it is, because of its potential. Yeah. I think a, a lot of influence on the NATO question is due to Brzezinski and, and not least to Henry Kissinger, who's still a, an influential fellow and who also does a hell of a lot of business in China. And as a, as a result, comes off in his pronouncements as someone who is a 
uh, seems to adore China at the, at the price of Russia. But, but are you suggesting that Kissinger does this because of his business interests? I'm suggesting there? it influences it, yes. Yeah, the, because of his business interests there, his writings suggest more of a get, let's do business with China and get tough with the Russians. I am because, suggesting that, yeah. What's well, the I, evidence, I, though? The evi I mean, is the evidence his writings, or the, which you're then reading into his motivation? I'm reading into it his, his motivation. I'm not a Kissinger fan, wasn't uh, in the <laughs> 70s, and, and, and not now. And I, but I also think intellectually uh, his, his argument for NATO expansion is specious, just as I do his, his, the way we... Uh, but Holbrook has behave. the same idea. I think he's wrong. And he doesn't have business interest in China. I think he's wrong. You know, I, I think that... Um, I think Everybody but, I know except, what's his name, Mandelbaum, now, uh, are yeah. arguing for NATO expansion. No, Almost. that's not the case at all, by the way. I mean, there's, there's a lot of... Uh, Most of the foreign policy people I know are saying, you know, be, the Russians are going to accept it, and they know look, that, and just get going, because uh, the downside is only having to do... I, I didn't come in here to have sure. a debate about sure. NATO, but that's where we are. But it's the, important. The it's probably the most important uh, issue that we have with Russia. Right. And we're pressing this issue and pressing this sh issue, and we, because, basically, we know that Russia is weak. It's to playing what poker downside, with then? I think you, you, you have no idea of the degree of resentment this causes in Russian elites. It's but, not a street uh, issue. Exactly. Absolutely not a street to. issue. It is not a street issue. So Russian elites view this as the United States, a superpower, super bully, pushing them when they're down, mm -hmm. and it's resentful. Look, it was, and there's more anti-Americanism now than there's ever been, as Zaganov told you and me, yeah. than there's ever been That's true. during the height of the Cold War. That's an exaggerated point, but but there That's is. What he said. Well, I think Zuganov is not. I think he was, Zuganov is exaggerating for an American audience, but it's true that there's a lot of anti-American feeling out there, and I think in this on this case, we're not blameless. Now, how much are you motivated by the fact that you you are Russophile and that I'm you are not. in love with you are you are in love with I Russian literature, you are in love with the country, you are romanticized by the country. Hey, look, I look in in, look in, in Lenin's tomb and in, in Resurrection. Uh, I s continue to celebrate the fact that the Soviet Union collapsed and Russia I is going through this... Uh, well, but to, to celebrate the collapse of the Soviet Union is not to still be romanticized by... Solzhen I don't think it's to ...by Solzhenitsyn and be romanticized by Tolstoy and to be romanticized by mm -hmm. the great Russian... I mean, you, rightly so, spent a good deal of this book, a uh, chapter, talking mm -hmm. about Russian writers, worrying that Russian writers may not be as good in the future as they have been in the past because there's no authority to rail against and to no, write poems about. No, the point is this. I just read you again. Uh, yes. <laughs> it happens, Charlie. I think it's great that Russian, Russian writers can write whatever they want. I would not want to return to a situation where a great Russian writer figure like Solzhenitsyn is necessary for political reasons. I think it's much healthier, in fact, that the audience is smaller because we're not, we don't ask of Russian writers any longer to be our newspaper, our government, our truth teller. We ask them to be writers, as we understand in the West. I think that's completely healthy. I'm, I'm delighted. Right, Would we'll just happens. answer this? Do you sure. feel more affinity for Russia than you do for China, just on a purely sort of emotional level? Yeah. Okay. Our case closed. All right. That case anyway. <laughs> that case anyway. All right. Let's go to some of the characters. Sure. There's this wonderful conversation which you've talked about on this program before with Khrushchev. And, and first of all, <laughs> the, the, K, the former KGB yeah, right. chief, the former KGB chief uh, Vladimir Khrushchev, who really was the mastermind of the coup in 1991. I don't think Gorbachev was, as, as some do. Uh, Conspiracy is everywhere. I wanted to see him. Of course, I wanted to see him. <laughs> and and uh, in, when I was covering the last election, the 1996 election, I I made inquiries. And the only reason he wanted to see me is because he had written a memoir and he wanted to publish it in the United States. He put you to flag his book. I mean, he's like the fifth flag former Soviet official. He's asked me if I know a good literary agent. <laughs> I mean, it's really very disheartening at the same time. And I went into his apartment and it looked more like a safe house than an apartment. There was about eight books and one of them was Yeltsin's autobiography and there were thousands of bookmarks, angry looking bookmarks coming out of... Uh, Yeltsin's autobiography, he'd obviously found many mistakes and uh, things he wanted to attack him for. But in the, in the, he was a very sort of sad little figure there in his apartment because he was just railing against things he had no control over. And you over. asked him about Alger Hiss and he didn't know who he was. He had no idea who he was, and you know, I believe him. I really believed him. His, his kind of uh, secretary, his assistant, had to remind him who Alger Hiss was. It's kind of strange. 
But do you, where do you stand on Hiss, though? You, you're convinced that... I'm not convinced, but, but most of the evidence seems to indicate that, uh, that he had dealings with the Soviet Union, yes. Yeah. He may not have given to them what the prosecutors argued in order to get a death penalty, but he at least gave them something. You know, it, it's... Um, you know, I think Mr. Rosenberg uh, uh, also was complicit with uh, the Soviet Union right. as well. Um, I was thinking about Rosenberg. No, but with, with his, obviously, there's a little bit more yeah. uh, mystery than the Rosenberg. No, uh, so far as I know, no KGB handler, as, as in the Rosenberg case, has come forward and explained his, uh, his activities with his. But the evidence, beginning with Alan Weinstein's book, Perjury, right. is, is, is pretty convincing, yeah. Yeah. Let me talk a little bit about the, the extent of the corruption. Chernomirdin is corrupt? I'll give you the facts as I know them and then you decide. Viktor Chernomirdin, the Prime Minister of Russia, uh, is said to, which is a trick, always a slippery journalistic phrase, but is said to have a 1% interest in by far the biggest corporation in Russia, Gazprom, which right. gets all, all, all kinds of favors, has 665,000 employees. Uh, its own social security system, fleet of airplanes. It's an enormous company. And if he has even anything close to 1%, he's a, one of the richest people in the country. Anatoly Chubais. Chubais. Anatoly Chubais is... Um, chief of staff for Yeltsin. Chief of staff for Yeltsin, now uh, deputy prime minister. Right. And he uh, was in charge of privatization and accused by uh, various newspapers and, and other press outlets, uh, Western and, and Russian, of doing all kinds of favors for buddies uh, in and outside of, of government and for misappropriating properties and, and all the rest. Um, but if you want to get a sense of how corrupt modern Russia is, it pays to know that 80% of the capital of the entire country is in Moscow. There are hundreds of criminal gangs in Moscow. If you go to a provincial city uh, in Yakutsk or just it, the many cities that are around the mm -hmm. former Soviet Union in Russia, very often you will run into a, literally a Mr. Big. And wealth will be all in the hands of Mr. Big, uh, whether it's a guy named the Poodle, I kid you not, in Khabarovsk, the Poodle, uh, or in a city like uh, Vladivostok, which is a port town. It's, it's all in the hands of the mob, which is closely tied to government. That is the way. Uh, provincial cities work. Moscow is much more complicated and these oligarchs mm. sort of are crossover figures. It is extremely corrupt. But by the way, from all I understand, so is China, so is Hungary, okay, so is Poland. Is corrupt? I don't have any, you know, smoking Is it said to be? Gun. Is he yes. said to be? Yes. And so the whole Yeltsin regime said to be corrupt? I think to some On extent, the tape, absolutely. You know. Yeah, I mean, look, selling out there to are the bankers, people with the money, giving there are, them license for a fee. There are bankers uh, who will tell you, big bankers, I mean, really big mm -hmm. figures, that if you go into a minister's office or a deputy minister's office, the price list for bribes is practically oh, on the wall. Yeah. And uh, that's the way it works. Here's the interesting thing: is that I just love sort of Mother Russia, the idea, you know, the art, the novel, the culture. Mm -hmm. And, and haven't had any experience that you have had, it is said that there is a threat to the paintings crumbling because not enough heat mm -hmm. and protection, right? Yes? Well, the, the, the culture is in serious, high culture is in a serious state, and um, especially in 92, 93, 94, Opera companies, the, the Bolshoi, the right. Kirov, and all these places struggle tremendously. So are schools, so are factories. Look, as, I, w as we began, Russia's going through a horrific series of transition. I, I don't want it to be forgotten in this conversation, however, that Russia did the big hard thing. It made its political breakthrough in 1991 that is an enormous historical achievement and for the most part, uh, one to be applauded, and it's filled with difficulty. Is and Italy, fact, is say Italy... it's a miracle that it survived at all. Yeah, is Italy without corruption to this day? Do we consider it a normal country? Italy, I I if you read the Italian papers, there's not a single minister or, uh, in Italy that isn't touched by corruption. Is it a normal state? Is the mafia a huge presence? Has it been throughout the 20th century? Yes. 
it, you know, it, we as Americans are, are extremely quick to, well, there's this enormous mafia in Russia, and dismiss it as if, it, it, as if we could go back to a status quo ante of 1975 and be happy. I wouldn't. I don't think most Russians would either. When you look at the Russian character from all these interviews and all these conversations, both with people in power and some of the people not in power, is there a yearning today for a kind of, uh, a kind of power figure, kind of dictator, a kind of absolutist to come in and take charge again and restore them to their former glory? It's always glory? a danger in Russia. It's always a danger that, that, um, that democracy the concept of democracy, just as the concept of capitalism, will be so corrupted so quickly that you can literally come in and campaign against democracy and capitalism. Uh, the figure that we may be leading to here is Alexander Lebed, right. who, if Yeltsin were to die tomorrow, certainly Lebed would be the top-ranked contender for this uh, pre Russian presidency. Even if he doesn't die, he's a top-ranked contender. Yeah, you, you know, you never know in the year 2000. It's yeah. a while from now, but I, I think you're probably right. And, uh, you know, and, but we have to remember that this is a guy whose role model, until he learned to clean this up for public relations reason, was Augusto Pinochet. Yeah. Chilean dictator. Mm-hmm. And now he talks about well, de Gaulle he did, he did, being... He, a, Pinochet did great things for the Chilean economy. The quote from Lebed, as I remember, is that, well, they got rid of 3,000 people, yeah, I know that. but they improved the economy right. and they handed it over to Democrats. Only 3,000, I think he said. Yeah. Yeah, but imagine that on a Russian scale. Yeah. I, I, look, I don't, think, I don't think Lebed is a murderer, but and I he's do think also, he's extremely... Here's up, what's interesting. Yeah. He, uh, Lebed comes to America in the last six months, maybe in the last couple months, mm -hmm. courting America. Yes, absolutely. Goes to the Council on Foreign Relations. Goes to Washington. Anybody can go to the Council well, of Foreign okay, I Relations. Know, I know, but... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which well, is, I think, a good thing about it. Of course. But, uh, but he courts the American establishment. You know, I mean, he's basically over here saying... I mean, I this is one of the lovely you. things about the new Russian politics. Gennady Zyuganov, Communist Party, comes to the Council on Foreign Relations. Alexander Lebed, his model is uh, Pinochet, comes to the Council. Right. I think, and that's know, great. I, and they're, they're the public opinion... Politics is ac actually a part of Russian life. I, I don't want to let this idea go. What's going right. to lead Russia uh, uh, to the future? What's going to help Russia overcome some of the historic factors working against it being all that it can be? Rule of law. Rule of law. And the understanding... A respect for the rule. Yeah, and understanding that rule of law is not some Western notion glommed onto Russian culture in some unnatural way. That there are Russian demagogues, demagogues who will... Uh, say that all this, all these Western notions of democracy and rule of law and so on, well, that, that's, that's for them. We believe in, a, in, in something quite different. And I think, I think Russia is going to get over that, and have, by the way. The polls on support for the notion of democracy uh, and on, on, de, uh, on democratic elections uh, are more encouraging with time, not less encouraging. Is it best for Russia that Yeltsin leave the scene one way or the other? Now? Yeah. Or he's, does he serve some role now? He's there. I'll tell you. Look, he is the president. Well, these questions are... He's, he's the president. I would say that, in, that the most encouraging thing he's done, besides show himself to be alive in the last year, is to appoint a guy named Boris Nemtsov as deputy prime minister. Nemtsov is a 37-year-old, very well-regarded reformer from Nizhny Novgorod. He sounds like nobody to us now. But all the, a lot of the democratically minded people in Russia consider him and say Grigory Yavlinsky, but even more Nemtsov, yeah. as the great comer in politics. Now the yeah, trick Yavlinsky has a lot of enemies because of his. His character is a little tricky and and, and uh, too cute uh, by half. Would maybe say maybe in a political in a political sense, right. yes. But Nemtsov is somebody who comes from the provinces. The trick for him will his reputation uh, survive his time with Yeltsin? Will he sully his hands? being with Yeltsin in this period of, of obvious decline. But what about the other Boris who's there, too? Berezovsky. Yes, Berezovsky. Boris, Boris Berezovsky. One of the richest men there. Yeah, and a very Inside the slippery Kremlin character. Now. He's one of these oligarchs I was referring yeah. to. A guy who made his fortune in car dealerships and... Uh, now has banks and media and everything. And, and a 51% stake in uh, state television, uh, basically a controlling interest in state television. 
That the, this is, and now he's uh, deputy minister of security. And okay. his only acquaintance with security, so far as I know it, is the bodyguards that have lugged around with him for the last several years because of assassination. Yeah, is he organized crime or not? <laughs> you know, I, I believe in libel laws, and I believe in having smoking guns when you call someone a crook. Yeah. But it's quite obvious that these oligarchs uh, uh, do business in, in a way that might get you arrested in another state. Yeah. yeah. Tell me about you now. What is it you enjoy the most? I mean... <laughs> well, look, I, I have written two books now right. about Russia. I am not... I am not a Russian scholar in the traditional sense. Well, you spent four years there? I spent four years there. I've read a lot about it. I'm, right. a, I'm a journalist. I'm a reporter, and I'm a storyteller. And the trick of nonfiction, in the way I approach it, or I, and, and others do, is to... to borrow from fiction in its structural techniques and building a character, but you have this burden of being true in its small facts and true to the trends of what's going on. Uh, you know, I'm starting a book now about uh, the Muhammad Ali Sonny Liston fights of 1964-65, which Why? are about, because to me, first of all, they're great narrative events. Ter and a terrific Lewiston, Maine. Oh, Lewiston, Maine, Miami <laughs> Beach. <laughs> yes. But it, it also involves um, race. It involves changing the changing figure of, 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 of black men from Floyd Patterson to Sonny Liston to Muhammad Ali. Mm. It involves the mob around Sonny Liston. It involves the Muslims and civil rights. So to me, it's a terrifically interesting story. Yeah. I went out to, there's a small personal note, I went out to Las Vegas at the time that Mike Tyson was preparing for the Buster Douglas fight, not yeah. preparing very yeah. well. Yeah, he was eating lunch, I think, for the whole time. <laughs> it was working yeah. out. And I was just, I mean, I was in awe how fast and his hands were and how powerful he was and all this. And we're at this gym, and the guy who, uh, who worked the gym owned the gym, so, and I sitting over talking while Tyson's working out. And I'm saying, tell me about Liston. And, and he said, before Liston died, talked to him and said, hmm. you know, they got to me. Yeah. Liston said that to Tyson. No, said that to this old guy who yeah. I was talking to who'd known the fight scene the, out there. That's the trouble with the fight scene. There are a lot of old guys <laughs> around with lots of stories to tell. The trouble with I Mike Tyson... I just it right up, though. The trouble with Mike Tyson is This that, guy was not a Tyson guy. He just was his gym. Yeah, yeah, this were, friend of mine, Michael Shapiro, a terrific boxing writer, really s says basically that in boxing it always takes two to make a great fight. And with Sonny yeah. Liston, and you, and you had that with Ali and Patterson as well. But with Mike Tyson, there's never been two. Yeah. And in a, in a way, he's not as interesting a story until he became very vulnerable. I mean, uh, there's a, this thing in New York uh, and in other cities called Classic Sports Network, and they showed one knockout after another yeah. Mike Tyson. It was boring after a while. Yeah. It was stupid. Tyson never really had this kind of narrative other to, to make a story with. Narrative other meaning another fighter that would be yeah. his equal. There's Ollie and Pat Frazier. Patterson and, and Johansson for a while. Right, or Dempsey, you know. Uh, Dempsey and Tunney. Exactly, exactly. And it's, uh, you know, it's a disgusting sport, but it, it never fails to be unbelievably interesting because of the rawness of it. It's amazing to me how many, I mean, David Halberstam is now writing about sports a lot, yeah. as you know. I mean, it's a baseball book. Yeah. I mean, you, you look at sports as a metaphor for, as a, I, not a metaphor, but what? It's not just a metaphor. It, it, it is, is of book. itself. because It's such a terrifically popular, uh, uh, um, it, it, pop, pop culture, music, and, and sports are, are, the, are the pillars of it. Um, but also, yes, it's a reflection of the times they take place. <laughs> Do you... Are you just doing writing what, where your curiosity takes you? And, yeah. And what, I, I think is that it, if, why you have the job you do at the New York? I mean, one day you're profiling Howard Stern. Yeah, my everlasting <laughs> shame, I suppose. <laughs> and then uh, other, no, and the next time you're profiling or, or, then, or writing then, about Ralph Ellison. Or Isaac Babel. Or, or Isaac Babel about, in yeah. the New York Review, review of Books. Yeah, I, I, I guess my, my strength and my greatest weakness as a writer is that, uh, you know, I'm the wandering Jew in terms of uh, subject is, is concerned. Oh, maybe no, that's Odyssey to what? It's a very good question. Look, I, I, I was a newspaper last, a good guy. question Yeah, here. <laughs> I mean, no, I was a newspaper guy, and somebody sent me to Moscow. Yeah. And I had interest in it. But... You know, the, the, the passion about it accumulated, one, accumulated once there. You know, I think at, you, you ask these questions, one asks these questions of oneself, at the, you know, a little later when you've accumulated a certain amount of work and you see where it's adding up toward. And so far, 
most of the concentration has been on this very strange odyssey abroad. Mm. And the idea to do this sports book is to thrust myself into what I think is maybe the central question in the United States, always, 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 race. and that's race. This book is Resurrection, A New Russia, David Remnick. Um, there's no better guest than David Remnick, and um, most of the people I know believe that uh, he's the best at what he does. It's always a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks a lot for having me. We thank you for joining us, and we'll see you tomorrow night.